Right, so um, just to give you some context for how this might be useful, is uh, suppose there was some disease like Ebola and we wanted to find out um, you know, what causes it, how is it, how is it transmitted, how can we treat it, so those kinds of questions. Um, we'd really like to, 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 to learn the answers to those questions. We'd like to get data from, from lots of hospitals and, and detailed data from uh, what's going on in those hospitals. But uh, the way hospitals work is there's laws that say, well, they can't share data. Um, everything has to be uh, confidential. Um, I mean, even, even within hospitals, like patients expect to, to, to have privacy and confidentiality in, in their, their treatments and so forth. So um, that's, that's one place where uh, this methodology could be useful. And um, it can also be useful in, in the social and behavioral sciences. Um, but uh, the, I think the, the medical example is a good one to keep in mind as we go through this. Um, so there's a bunch of people I've worked with that I want to acknowledge. Um, all right, so here's the traditional experimental design that we use in medicine and psychology. Um, we generate a hypothesis, and we uh, talk to the IRB, and, and they give us approval to go ahead with the, uh, with the experiment, and, and um, uh, then we enroll participants, and uh, we ask them to agree to participate, um, and, and we have uh, a bunch of measures. So we collect data from them, we administer surveys, we um, take uh, uh, physiological measurements. Now we collect all this data together into our computer usually, and, uh, and we run it, run it through our statistical modeling software, and then we Whatever we discover, we, <coughs> we write that up and we, we publish it. Um, so that, that's kind of the way things are done currently. And um, I guess the part I want to focus on here is the statistical analysis part. Uh, there's, there's two ways to do, two uh, major ways to, to approach the statistical analysis. There's like a kind of a, a Bayesian approach, and then there's a, a maximum likelihood kind of approach. And um, they're not that different, but I'm going to focus on the maximum likelihood approach here and just kind of walk through the details very quickly so you get an idea of how we can do this without ever seeing the data. <clears throat> so um, this is the, the current paradigm paradigm where we do need all the data in a central place. Here's one, uh, one individual. Um, this, uh, this curve here is just a normal distribution for the, the, log, the log of the normal distribution. Uh, these are the parameters. It's a uh, mean of 3.6, standard deviation of 1.2. And uh, the individual in this case is, has a 1.9 in, uh, in this measurement. And then we read off the likelihood of so we go up to 1.9, and then we read off the like log likelihood of uh, minus 2.5. So if you may not be familiar with this procedure, but all we're doing here is we're applying Bayes' theorem. So uh, if you know something about statistics, this is you know this is pretty straightforward. Um, so we go through and we do this procedure with all our participants. So this, and the only difference here is they have different, they have a different measurement. So this one is reads three on that measure, and then we read, read off the log likelihood there on the uh, y-axis. And then the way this uh, model fitting works is we just add up all these log likelihoods. Uh, these are the, the numbers, the likelihoods I just went through, and um, then this this optimizer tries to uh, find the best mean and standard deviation uh, to maximize that sum. Alright, so now let's see how we can do that without seeing the data. So it's pretty similar, but 
the difference is that each of these participants has their data and they're not sharing it with us. And what they do is they just communicate likelihoods. So, uh, so we have the same participant here and they compute their likelihood and send it back to us and then we add it up. And so this, the same second participant and we add it up. So it's, it's the same, the same thing except that we don't have the data. We just talk to, we just message our participants over a smartphone or something like that. And, um, and given, given our model parameters, what's, what's the likelihood uh, of, of the, uh, given your data, what's the likelihood of this model? So, so it's a very similar approach here, except that the data, we never see the data. The data is always with the participants. Right, so, um, so we needed a good acronym for this. So we call this uh, maintained individual data. Everybody has their own data. It's their property. It's private. We never see it. And the way we fit statistical models is with this distributed likelihood estimation. Um, and called middle, kind of that package. So, um, so I started this presentation with the traditional experimental design. Now we're gonna we're gonna see what we can do. We can uh, we can re rearrange how things fit together. Um, you know, using middle, it kind of it gives us more freedom in how we organize things. So again, we have hypothesis generation, and then there's the uh, experiment experiment. Experimental design and IRB approval, and then we send our experiment over to um, some intermediary like the National Institute for Health or um, maybe the Open Open Science people, and um, they kind of manage this whole process. And they might have like an app store for science where participants can and browse and, and look for experiments that they're interested in participating in. And as soon as they consent to participate in, in an experiment, then um, immediately we have access to, if, if they consent, we have access to all their, uh, their past data that they've collected. They've been, you know, they may have had their smart on, smartphone on for a few years. So, um, so that gives you a, a huge head start in data collection. And of course, we can collect uh, new measurements from them. And then we have this uh, distributed likelihood estimation um, that I just described. So then there's this model optimization, testing, modification. And then we uh, disseminate our results and try to improve our theory. And then we might uh, kind of package the whole thing up and send it off to PubMed or something like that for archival and keeping track of provenance. All right, so, um, so you, you may have, uh, if you recall the traditional experimental design, it was, it was very linear, right? So you, you have to do all these steps in sequence, but with middle, it's like it can all kind of happen at once. There's, there's more, uh, uh, there's more chance to kind of do things in parallel. So there's a lot of potential benefits. Um, immediately we have uh, uh, new experiments start with previously collected data, and then there's there's longitudinal linking without a linking table. You don't have to um, try to figure out which participant this whole data came from because participants have only their own data, so it's very easy. Um, and we can stop data collection once once sufficient power is achieved. Um, uh, the data analysis and collection kind of proceed simultaneously. Uh, there's less burden and risk for participants, less new data. The data remains with the participant, we never see it. Um, we could I think I touched on most of the other things here. We'll come back to this if there's interest. 
So um, the challenge is what we're working on now is uh, we need to carefully audit the protocol for security and privacy. Um, it doesn't do any good if I mean, we promise privacy, but somehow there's data leaks or something. Uh, we need new statistical theory because this this distributed likelihood estimation is a little bit different from maximum likelihood. And um, um, so one of my colleagues is working on that, trying to understand uh, when we know we have enough data because um, because we, we, can, we can always keep getting more data and it's, it's, there's always some variation that's changing. There's, so working on that and um, we probably need to develop new best practices for informed consent as well. How's my time? Okay. Um, okay, well, um, yeah, so are there any questions? Especially with as humanities really move into um, non-consumptive analysis of so a large textual corpora, um, have you seen other um, applications of these approaches um, where security isn't that big of a security of, of leaking information isn't that big of a deal, but you have other concerns about copyright um, or um, even if you're throwing different statistical models. Um, not being able to rerun the, that information, you can't fully verify that. Have you seen any other issues around that? Um, okay, so your question, I'm not sure I understand your question. Your question is about, um, so you, privacy is not so important, but, but you wanted to... Uh, well, I, I guess it, it's more of... Um, I guess it's more around policies around the gatekeepers. Okay. Um, and if you had a slide where it spoke at um, open, open Data Center uh, sure. Science, when you're working with them, are you kind of leaking, are you uh, giving, let me, let me think for a second here, just to, um, are there policies around that and issues um, that you can foresee if you try to expand this model to other places? Because you're, you're working at it in a very specific kind of research, right? Um, and a lot of us are working in research that is is outside of that very specific thing. Um, yeah, well, uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm sorry. I, uh, we were just trying to get it working in this context, and then <laughs> and then we'll see if we can apply it in other areas. Uh, but, but this is already a pretty big challenge, so I'm sorry, I, I can't really, yeah. I guess my question is, how does privacy actually maintain if you're using an equation? If they're giving you like a likelihood with the equation, I can go back and actually figure out their data, their actual data points. So right. How do you deal with that? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's, uh, that's a really good question. So how do we maintain the um, uh, privacy? Well, so, <coughs> For, for example, this person, they might have a value of uh, 5.9 here, or they, they could have a measurement on this side, and we get the same likelihood. So, so that, that doesn't maintain privacy really well, right? I agree. But if the model's more complicated, then, it, then, it, then this, um, uh, when you reduce the, this, this whole uh, a complex model to, to a single likelihood number, then it is more of a, a many to one kind of mapping. So you, there, there is a, uh, a more condensation of information for more complicated models. So, but, but you're right, this does need further research and uh, mm -hmm. one, one way of, um, one way we've discussed of, of trying to uh, improve the privacy protection is to to add some kind of uh, random noise into this, and then um, just to increase our sample size to compensate for it. I mean, just another question: Is that limitation if you're trusting audit the data in terms of like sensors on your phones or whatever? So 
what concerns do you have about the data that's being reported to you in terms of the accuracy of those sensors or the people themselves reporting the data? Um, okay, well, uh, uh, so, your, so your question is about the accuracy of the data that people are, are suppose I, I send out a survey, um, are you HIV positive? You know, and people are saying yes or no on that. So, well, then that's that linear, right? So there's no privacy there if it's, a, if it's a yes or no response. So that's but, but the response is kept on their phone. It's not given to us. So is, is that the kind of, are you asking about that? Or? Any data that you're collecting, if you're not actually, you're not in a, you're not coming into you that you can validate the data. It's just being or human errors. You know, just repeating the wrong number or hitting the wrong button. Yeah, but even some lies or just like, for instance, the Apple app for the art rates and steps and stuff like that. If you don't walk with your phone and collect steps, the data is incorrect, right? So mm -hmm. those are the kind of things we're concerned about if we're using some type of sensor. Right. Um, well, yeah. So I mean, those are um, uh, right. So there's a, there's a bunch of different ways to uh, uh, to, to try to get at that problem. Um, you could bring uh, a random selection of those people into into the lab to um, to interview them if they, if they consent for that, uh, and some of it can be just handled by sample size. You know, we, we hope to be able to recruit much larger samples using this methodology um, with less expense. So part part of it can be addressed that way. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, Marshall, for your presentation.